this section we're going to be making up some horse manure substrate which is the substrate of choice for your table mushrooms, the agaricus uh, portobellos. It is also the substrate of choice for such species as Psilocybe cubensis and Paniolus cyanescens. As you can see here, we have very well field aged manure and that is important. One, because you don't want to stink up your house when you bring it in. And the field age manure is going to have absolutely zero odor to it whatsoever. When you go out to collect your horse manure, it's important that you don't get what they sweep out of the stable. That's typically going to be very fresh and green and often they put cedar chips in it to control odor. And cedar is a very nice antifungal, so it's not going to work very well in your substrate. Go out into the pasture and I can gather up a pretty large bag in about 10 minutes just by taking a rake and a shovel or you can even pick it up with just some gloved hands and a large bag. But for the home grower you can get it very quickly that way and the rain will have leached it and the sun will have dried it for you and you'll have nice dry hard nuggets like this that will break up very well and the mycelium will colonize it very well. So let's get started. We're going to break this up uh, with gloves. Uh, there's no bacteria really, it's not dangerous, but the fibers in it will irritate your hands if you break up a whole bowl like this. So I typically just put on a pair of kitchen gloves and break it up. And then we're going to be adding moisture to it and we'll take it to field capacity, which a little later on I'll explain to you how we do that and how we get the moisture content just right. So let's get started. to add anywhere from about 10 to 20 percent vermiculite by volume. It's optional of course but the vermiculite does provide somewhat of a reservoir effect. It helps to hold in the moisture. Uh, don't skimp out on gypsum. Gypsum provides calcium and sulfur that are both essential nutrients and it also helps to protect against pH swings and keeps the substrate nice and loose. So use gypsum at about 5 to 10 percent and vermiculite at about 10 to 20 percent and you'll notice a definite boost. Be sure to mix your dry ingredients uh, very well before you add your moisture. If you've already hydrated the substrate, it's really hard to get the gypsum to mix in properly. to massage and uh, really squeeze the substrate well to make sure you get the moisture pushed into all the fibers. I'll just continue adding moisture and mixing it in slowly until I get to the right point. We're looking for field capacity, which I'll explain in a few minutes in a bit more detail, but basically that says when we squeeze a handful, we just get a few drops to a small stream coming out, and as you can see, we're not quite there yet.
Okay, right here is what we're looking for. As you can see, when I give it a good hard squeeze, a small stream comes out for just a second or two and then stops. So let's go over exactly what we did to get to this point. We slowly added moisture until we got to the point where when we pick up a small handful, no water drips out just by gravity alone. If we squeeze gently, one or two drops will fall and if we squeeze really hard a small stream will flow and then stop after a second or two. So let's watch it again. You can see here as I hold a small handful there's no water dripping out at all. When I squeeze gently as you see we get one or two drops and then as I squeeze hard we've got a small rivulet coming out but it only flows for a second or two and then stops. This is what we're looking for and what we call field capacity. Let's get our jars loaded so we can get them into the pasteurization bath. Of course, if you were doing a large quantity, you wouldn't waste your time loading the substrate into quart jars to pasteurize. You'd look for a, a bigger method. But for the home grower that's only going to make up a few substrates at a time, this is an excellent and easy, relatively mess-free way to pasteurize your manure. Of course, you can put real lids on the jars if you want to. I already have a lot of this foil preformed from uh, pressure cooking, so I just stick it over the jar. All we're really trying to do is prevent moisture that forms on the lid of our kettle from dripping down into the jars and running the moisture content. So just cover them with whatever you have available. The foil works great because I like to stick a thermometer through from the top to record temperature as you'll see in a few minutes. I filled the kettle with cold water. You always want to start out with cold water. Glass is an insulator, so you want the water to heat up slowly along with the glass so that the heat will transfer into your substrate. Now I have this meat thermometer stuck through the foil and into the center of the horse manure in one of the jars. As you can see here, the water is boiling, but the temperature is still pegged down on the uh, low part of the gauge. So it takes a few minutes. Now when the temperature reaches 140, or 60 Celsius, simply shut off the stove and the temperature will climb gradually up to about 160 or so. And if the temperature drops below 140 or below 60 Celsius, within an hour, just turn the stove back on and heat it back up again. But you want to make sure you maintain your pasteurization temperature for one full hour. In the previous chapter, we pasteurized a batch of horse manure. It's now had time to cool off down to room temperature, and we're going to put it into some substrate trays, and we'll let those colonize, and then in about a week or two, we'll put a casing layer on it. What we'll be using today is these plastic baking trays. They're real good for small, home-style type grows. And we have several jars of fully colonized portobello mushroom spawn that we're going to be breaking up and putting it in with the horse manure. Uh, as you've seen in some of the other sections, I like to use a bicycle tire to break it up. To me, it's the easiest and the fastest method to break up our fully colonized spawn jars. We can shake them all we want, as you see, and really nothing happens. But uh, about 10 or 12 wax on the tire. And we'll just have every one of these kernels separated. By the way, it only takes one time getting your finger between the jar and the tire, and you won't do that again, trust me. Looks like it's pretty well broken up there. So the next step, we're going to put some of this uh, horse manure compost down in the tray, and we'll layer a little bit of the uh, spawn we just broke up and a little more horse manure. So let's get started. And now we'll 
gonna take a jar of spawn here and we'll just layer it on. Put about half of it in and I mix it around a little bit. I don't like to stir it up because we can damage our grain spawn. And if you damage it, you can open up the center of the kernels where it's not colonized and possibly get some contamination in there. It also seems to recover just a tad faster if you layer it like this. about a half inch up here in the top of the tray for a casing layer but we can put just a bit more spawn and just a little bit more manure to cover it up get it about as even as I can without getting too carried away. Just about like that. And then we'll cover it up. It's okay if there's a few grain kernels exposed. We want to cover it up during colonization. That'll help keep it in the dark keep it from drying out and it'll also help keep the CO2 levels a little high and uh, stop it from using up so much of our substrate. Now I'm going to poke just a couple of holes here for gas exchange. Just about like that. That's enough. And there we have it. <music>